Today I want to go over a couple of different travel routers from gl.inet. If you want to learn more about the differences in these devices and how they perform and ultimately which one I opted to use, then watch the rest of this video. Back in early 2022, I did a video on my previous choice of travel routers, the GLMT1300 from the same company, gl.inet. I've been using this router for a couple years and still works really well. I keep it in my gear bag and I use it for a variety of use cases. There isn't really much competition in this arena and the field is really dominated by gl.inet, who in my opinion makes some of the best performing products in this category. Don't get me wrong, but the GLMT1300 is still a great product and depending on your needs still may be a good option for you. My reasoning for wanting to upgrade was better performance, especially to local storage and to possibly use some of the newer VPNs such as TailScale, which is now supported in both of these, these models that we're going to cover today, as well as a few others. To start with, let's do a quick comparison between the current MT1300 and the new models, the GLMT3000 and the GLAXT1800, to better understand what the key differences are before we get into the setup and testing of each device. I created this chart to kind of highlight some of the key differences between the two devices and compare it to the MT1300. Keep in mind that these are published specs and the actual performance will vary significantly depending on how you're connected. Let's start by looking at the maximum rated speed for each device. Based on the chart, the 5 GHz performance of the MT3000 appears to be much faster. Both new models have support for WPA3 and all three can act as a Wi-Fi repeater. They all have dual band Wi-Fi and each has at least two Ethernet ports with the MT1300 and the AXT1800 having three ports. Going down to the WireGuard and OpenVPN performance, things get a little bit interesting. Both the new models are far more capable than the MT1300, but because the AX1800 has a quad-core CPU, it handles WireGuard's encryption much better than the MT3000, even though the raw speed of the MT3000 is faster. So now let's take a quick look at what comes in the box, and we'll look at the devices themselves. With the GLMT3000, you get a 15-watt USB-C power supply and three power adapters that support different parts of the world. Looking at the back of the MT3000, you see the USB-C plug, and next to that you get a 2.5 gigabit WAN port, which allows you to use greater than 1 gig connections, though not likely to be useful on a travel router. It may come in handy if you actually pop this into a small home or a business. Next to that, you get the 1 gig LAN port for connecting a single device or a small portable switch. Next to that is a USB 3 connector so that you can attach external storage to it for sharing files and streaming media. We'll cover more on this later in the video when we go through the setup of the shared storage. On the left side, you get a reset switch and a function toggle switch, which we'll cover when we go through that setup section later in the video. Let's take a quick look at the AXT1800 for comparison. The contents of the box are similar, but you get a 20 watt USB-C power supply and only one power adapter. For some unknown reason, for a product that's somewhat marketed as a travel router, it doesn't contain any other power adapters other than the one suited for your country. Looking at the back of the unit, you see the USB power plug, a USB port for storage and cellular modems, two gigabit LAN ports, instead of the one that comes with the MT3000 for connecting up to two devices or switches directly, and one gigabit WAN port for attaching to your internet source, such as a modem. The left side of the device is exactly like the MT3000, and you get a reset switch and a function toggle. On the right side is where you see another difference between the MT3000 and the AXT1800, which has a micro SD card which will allow you to use it for file sharing and file streaming. Physically, the AXT800 is a little larger, though not real significant. It's slightly thicker, wider, and longer, and a little heavier than the MT3000, though in my experience with both of them, the extra size really wasn't much of an issue. The MT3000 is actually 106 by 83 by 33 millimeters, weighing in at about 196 grams, and the AXT1800 is 125 by 82 by 36, weighing in at 245 grams. 
Now let's get into the setup of these devices and do some performance testing. Though I set up each device separately in order to test it out and show the results, the interface, process, and web admin are exactly the same for both devices. So I'm just going to cover one of them and I'll use the MT3000 and then show the test results for each device separately. Whichever device you're setting up and configuring, the first step is to connect to the web admin panel so that you can set up all the configurations. To do this, you need to select the new access point by going to your Wi-Fi and joining either the 2.5 or the 5 GHz access point, and you can usually tell by the name. In my case, I'm setting up the MT3000, so I'm going to select the 5G network. Once you try and join the access point, you'll be prompted for the password, which is actually located on the label itself on the back of the unit. Type the password or key. And once you're connected, launch your browser and type 192.168.8.1 to access the web admin screen. Next, you need to answer the default language. And when you hit next, you'll be prompted to create a new admin password. This password is used only to access the admin panel and not to access the Wi-Fi itself. Once you change the password, you may have to log in again to configure the rest of the settings. Once you complete that section, you're taken to the internet section. This section is the one that you use most of the time when you're out on location. This is where you can bridge the device and connect to any available network. There are four options on the screen. The first, that if needed in your configuration, you can switch the WAN port, which in this case is a 2.5 gig WAN port, and have it be used as an alternate LAN port. This configuration isn't really typical, but it's nice to know you have the option and that's available to you. If you plug the WAN port into an actual modem, it will automatically be detected and it should show on the above screen as being connected to an Ethernet. That might make sense in a home router, but most of the time you'll be connecting using one of the other three options, the repeater, tethering, or using a cellular modem. If you're bridging this, then the repeater section is what you're going to use. If you have a cellular modem or if you're tethering to your phone, you'll use the appropriate section. Let's go through the tabs and get an overview of what's configurable, and then we'll set it up as a repeater so we can get some performance measurements. Using the repeater is the more typical use case when you're using this as a travel router. If I click on the wireless section, I can see all the current settings for the wireless. By default, the settings are already configured for you, including the SSID password. Though it's kind of nice to have a fairly complex password, I prefer to change it and select my own. To do this, just click on Modify and type a new password. You'll have to do this to both the 5 and the 2.4 GHz section. As a precaution, I would make sure that you view the password before hitting Apply, as you won't be able to access the access point if you mess up on the password without doing a factory reset. Click on Apply when you're done, and you're good to go. If you were connected to that wireless network when you made these changes, you'll have to reconnect to continue your modifications. The next section is the client section. This is where you can review who's connected and block anyone that's not supposed to be able to connect to the internet. Directly below that is the VPN section. As I want to get more detail on this, I want to do a separate video on VPNs, especially using TailScale. Though WireGuard is built into the device, TailScale has to be installed, as currently it's not there out of the box, even if it's supported. Moving to applications, let's take a look at the network storage section. Once you plug a drive into the USB port, you can enable services such as Samba, which you'll need for file sharing and media streaming. To configure this section, you need to first install a USB drive. We'll cover more on this later in the video. Next, you have the built-in ad guard, which is off by default, but you can enable it if you want to give it a try. It offers tracking and ad blocking. It'll force you to use AdGuard DNS servers for enhanced security. I haven't had the opportunity to test this out, but once I find out more information about it, I can post an update if anyone wants to know or is interested in how that worked out. The firewall section will allow you to do things like port forwards, open ports on your router, as well as create a DMZ. I wouldn't recommend using any of these, especially as a travel router. Under the LAN section, you can modify the subnet. By default, it's 192.168.8.xxx, which in most cases should be fine. However, if you want to do something different, you can change it here. You can also change the amount of devices that can be connected. The network mode allows you to change the behavior of your device and change it from the default router mode to an access point or extender. This is nice to have, but again, unless you have a unique requirement, you most likely will leave it in the default router position 
is that's most useful most of the time. Under the system section, we have an overview which gives you details on the router, such as CPU, memory, and other information about the device. In the upgrade section, assuming you already have connected the device, it will automatically check for an update and prompt you when one is available, give you the option to upgrade with one click, which will download and run the installation. The time zone section allows you to sync your time zone or to manually select it. You do have to be connected to the internet first for your browser and your router to hit the correct time zone while you're traveling. The last section we cover before hooking this up is toggle button settings. This is to customize the side button on your device to suit your particular needs. You can have it enable or disable AdGuard, OpenVPN, Tor, or WireGuard features once they've already been configured. So now that we've actually covered most of the features, let's actually get this thing connected. To connect, go back up to the internet section on the top and click on repeater, select connect, and this should bring up a list of available network. If you're traveling or in a hotel, it's gonna show you whether or not the networks are 2.4, five gigahertz, or mixed. Select the one that you wanna use and you'll be prompted for the password for that Wi-Fi network if a password is required. After you finish the password, hit apply and it'll connect you and show you the information about the network you're connected to. Remember that in some hotels, you may have to launch the browser and it'll take you to a login page so you can authenticate. And you may have to do that every 24 hours, depending on what the requirements of the hotel. This is usually the case in larger hotels where they restrict access to guests only. Now that we're connected, let's do a quick speed test. I ran the speed test with both devices using the same settings in repeater mode and got basically the same performance. As a Wi-Fi repeater, the speed is not going to be as fast as a straight connection, but overall the speed was pretty good with no noticeable lag. As I expected to actually see a difference between the two units based on specs, I decided to try to test this a little differently to see if I could highlight any differences at all by using a disk benchmark from Blackmagic in lieu of just a bandwidth test. It's a really strange way to test Wi-Fi performance, but hopefully it will highlight any differences if there are any in data throughput. To be able to actually use the Blackmagic utility, you first need to set up file sharing and create a, sh a network share. I used my Samsung T7 for the test so the drive itself would not be a bottleneck. After plugging it into the USB drive, I enabled Samba and hit apply. Next, click on shared folders, and click add so that we can create a new share. You should see a listing of folders that are currently on the external drive. Remember that using the web interface that only the folders that have already been created will appear on the external drive, as that all we're really doing is creating a share or access to that particular folder. If you need to create a new folder, you can either do it when the USB is attached to the computer or use the mobile app. Select the folder you want and hit next. Here we need to assign some users. If you created users from the main tab, they should show up here from the drop down. But if you don't have any users, just click on add user and create one or more users. Once you're done, simply select the users from the drop down to assign the correct permissions, either writable or read only. When you're done, click apply and your screen should look something like this when you're done. And you should now be able to access them either using the file explorer, the finder, or the mobile app. To access using the Windows Explorer, type backslash backslash 192.168.8.1 backslash docs, which is the folder that we're sharing, in the top address bar, and it should prompt you for a username and password. Input one of the users that you created, and you should be able to see the files. Now that we've created a share, let's run a non-traditional test using Blackmagic's disk testing software. This test is definitely not created for testing wireless, but it serves as a great tool to see how fast data is being transferred. As you can see from the right testing, the MT3000 seems to be quite a bit faster and seems to be able to move more data. Because I'm using this device for streaming media, file sharing, and internet sharing as well, data throughput is important to me. So which one of these did I choose and why? I ended up choosing the GL MT3000 as the device for me. Given that in typical use cases, both of these devices would perform very well, it was tough to make the decision strictly on performance. The AXT1800 has a faster quad-core CPU, making it an ideal WireGuard client. However, given that these devices are more limited by the wireless performance than by CPU performance, 
in my opinion, the AXT 1800 wouldn't have benefited me that much. I would have liked to have the micro SD card slot, but in the end, the lower power requirement and the overall faster wireless performance were the deciding factors for my particular needs. Neither of these devices, or even the older MT1300, which is a lot cheaper, is a good choice and served you well as a great travel router. I'm really impressed with the GL.inet products overall as they provide a nice blend of ease of use, flexibility, price, and power. I'll leave links to all three of these travel routers that we discussed today should you want to pick one up. Please post any questions in the comments below and let me know if you have a travel router or plan to get one. That's about it for today's video, so please give it a like if you found this useful and don't forget to subscribe so you'll be notified of when there's new content. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.